Turn with me please to uh, two openings, Isaiah the first chapter and Ephesians the sixth chapter. Now we began a series a while back called Willing and Obedient. And everybody was excited about it. You, you remember? <laughs> oh yeah. And um, the Lord dealt with me about some of these things back when I was a, uh, a boy. And some of the first things he showed me in the Word was along this line. And uh, as a young man in the ministry, and not that I'm old yet, but <laughs> approaching middle age now. Uh, but as a younger man, the Lord dealt with me to emphasize this a lot. I've taught on it a lot. And I knew it was important, but the further I go, the more important I see that it is. It's much more important than I even thought. Uh, Isaiah 1, beginning about verse uh, 2, he said, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. What have they done? I believe from, from my understanding of, of scriptures and fellowship with the Lord, that this is particularly offensive to him. Particularly offensive to him. It has happened over and over again that God's creation has rebelled against him. It's happened with the angels under the devil's deception and leadership. It's happened with mankind. It's happened over and over again. And I believe it is particularly offensive to him. He just, he hates it. He hates rebellion and defiance. Not only because of it, its impact on him, but what it does to the people who are rebelling. Because the outcome of rebellion unchecked and unrepented is destruction. It is destruction. And uh, I believe there's much more to this than we even know. Looking back in ages past, we're, we're not told everything that has happened in the eons past. But I, I believe it's happened repeatedly that God's created beings and he blessed beings and they rose up and rebelled against him. And all he ever did was love them <laughs> and bless them and use them and give them a place next to him. And that's the thanks he got was defiance and rebellion and disobedience. And I believe for who knows how long? I believe it's a very, 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 very long time. God's been looking for a people that will willingly, nobody's making them, willingly submit themselves to Him and humble themselves before Him and obey Him because they want to. And be faithful to him. Yes. And he's got a group. Amen. I said he's got a group. Yes, they hadn't done it all always perfectly, but he's got a group that that's their heart. Yes. And he's got a group that's going to be his forever. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. I believe that throughout the ages to come, you and I that will make it all the way through this and be His past this life, I don't think anything would ever be able to get you and me to defy God Amen. in the ages to come. We were here on the earth. 
We saw what sin and death does. We saw and lived through what rebellion does. I don't believe um, 500,000 years from now, 2 million years from now, I don't believe anything or anybody could come and get you and me to rise up against God. We're His. Hallelujah. And I believe that makes us the apple of His eye. We are His special people that chose him. Hallelujah. He chose us and we chose him too. Hallelujah. Finally. But thank God we are not the defiant. We are not the rebellious. We are his. Somebody say I'm his. I'm his. He said in verse 3 the ox knows his owner the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not consider. If someone is created you and is giving you your every breath and the energy to have a thought and sustaining the gravity of the planet you live on, you ought to acknowledge that. Is that right? That's what he said. The ox knows who his owner is, the donkey knows who his master is, but my people they act like they don't know who their God is. Well, we know who our God is. Come on, somebody say, I know who my God is. My God is. Verse 19, he said, verse 19, If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. These two verses are absolutely true, aren't they? Cause and effect. How many want to be blessed? You want to enjoy the good of the land. Uh, the, the BBE says the good things of the land will be yours. Um, several translations say the best of the land will be yours. The Living Bible says, if you'll only obey, I'll make you rich. Well, if you're enjoying all the good things of the land, I reckon you're rich. Pretty good definition of rich. You got the good house, you got the good cars, you wear the good clothes, you eat the good food. Hmm? And I know some folks mock at this and call it materialism and what have you, but is the Bible true or is it not? Is it true or not? If, if Abraham was here, uh, would he tell you that God is a God who likes your poor? No, sir. Abraham, no. Isaac, no. Jacob, no, sir. David, no. Solomon, no. No. Job. No, sir. You've been reading about Job. Yes, you hear some folks say talk about poor old Job. You hadn't read the book. <laughs> Historians tell us that probably the whole ordeal of Job happened less than a year, maybe nine months. He had a bad year. <laughs> he had a rough time, but the Lord restored him when he humbled himself and repented and gave him twice as much as what he had. And in the beginning, he was the richest man in the East. By today's standard, he was a billionaire. Poor old Joe. I don't think so. Sit out loud. If you're willing, if you're willing and, obedient, and obedient, you shall, you shall eat, the eat the good, the best, the best of, the land. of the land. Is the next verse just as true? Yes. Yes, we'll say that out loud too then. If you refuse, if you refuse and, rebel, and rebel, you'll be devoured. You'll be well, that's true too, yes. isn't it? How many really believe verse 19 is true? If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. You really believe that? What if you're not eating the good of the land? Hmm. <laughs> Ephesians 6, go over there. We'll see if we like this any better. Ephesians 6 and 1. This is New Testament now, right? Children, 
Obey, obey. Obey is nowadays a politically incorrect word. Right? <laughs> you, I mean, you just say it. And people look at you funny like, obey? Well, you better tone it down a little bit. <laughs> obey. <laughs> obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Isn't this the same principle? Obedience, honor, and respect, and it going well with you. And you're living a long time. Why? Because it's the easiest to learn obedience, submission, and respect when you're two and three. Because you you don't know anything else. It's very sad that people, parents, have read unbelievers' books on child rearing and gone by those things instead of the Word of God. And you have a generation that is so defiant, so disrespectful, so rebellious, and the sad part is what it's going to do to them. If you don't learn respect for, for your parents and for people, your teachers, your coaches, your employer. It's not going to go well with you. Even if you're a Christian, you can pray and believe God and He can get you the right spouse, the right partner. But if you're too disrespectful and too rebellious, you can mess it up. Next thing you know, you're divorced. God can get you the right job in the right profession. But if you're too rebellious, get fired. Did you hear me? Or be so belligerent, you just quit and walk off and leave the will of God. And when you leave the will of God, where are you going? Where are you headed? You know, before you jump up and spout off and throw your tools down and clean out your desk, you need to ask yourself a big question. What am I leaving? And where am, what am I going to? Well, I was just too mad. Well, you need to act like a Christian. Get a hold of yourself, bite your tongue, say yes sir, yes ma'am, go home and pray. You can always quit tomorrow if you want to. (laughs) Is that right? But don't do something because of a rage of the flesh or because of hurt feelings. That's being carnal like any unsaved man or woman. Somebody looked at me like, I don't know, I didn't know I was getting that today. That's just hold on. It's going to help you out. What are we talking about? It going well with you and even living a long time. There's a lot of folks in our generation that are dead and gone, dead at 18, dead at 25, dead at 30 because they didn't know how to keep their mouth shut. Are you listening? Because they didn't know how to curb their flesh. Because they didn't know how to turn around and go home. They didn't know how to not take a dare. Come on. Pride. Defensiveness. Rebellion. Defiance. Nobody's going to talk to me like that. Bring a knife to a gunfight. (laughs) Bang, bang. (laughs) Well, it didn't go well with them. Is that right? On their fourth marriage. On their ninth job, always starting over. God, why is it this way? Well, you're not eating the good of the land. It's not going well with you. Why? Not willing, not obedient. (laughs) We are reading the scriptures now, aren't we? Go with me to James, please. It's not just an Old Testament concept. Ephesians is in the New Testament. Right? As are many other verses. James is in the New Testament. Look at James, the fourth chapter. The Lord showed me something yesterday I want to share with you. 
It has to do with us not being ignorant of his devices. Hallelujah, I'm excited. So if I don't tell you, remind me. Ask me if I, if I get off on something else, say, hey, you were going to tell us something. James 4, very familiar passage of Scripture to many, but it's often quoted split in two. Just half of it is quoted. In James 4, 6, says, He, God, gives more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. The only way it's going to go well with us in this curse-filled earth is by the grace of God. Hmm? And the only way we're going to make it through all the dangers and pitfalls and and not succumb to disease or disaster or accident or crime. If we make it through birth to old age, it'll be because the Lord sustained us. Amen. It'll be by His, it, we were protected by His grace. We were provided for by His grace. That's what Psalm 91 is painting a picture of. Anybody remember the end of Psalm 91? With long life, I'll satisfy him and show him my salvation. Well, what is Psalm 91 known as? The protection psalm. How did you make it? The arrow that flies by day didn't get you. The pestilence that walked at night and at noon, it didn't get you. All those things didn't get you. The Lord kept you. His angels kept you. His power sustained you. That was all his grace. Yes. Who's going to get that? Who gets the grace of God? Not everyone. Not, it's available to any who will believe and respond correctly, but not everyone's going to enjoy the grace of his protection and provision. That's obvious. People are perishing on every side. Who gets the grace? Come on, help me out. Who gets it? The proud don't get the grace. They get resisted. Rebellion is a manifestation of pride. One of the big, one of the big reasons why people rebel and are defiant is because of pride and selfishness. The proud get resisted. I don't want to get resisted. Do you? I mean, life is tough enough. <laughs> Without, you don't want to get resisted of God. You want to get helped of God. Who's going to get to help? The humble. He gives grace to the humble. Keep reading. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. This is humbling yourself. Who's going to get to grace? The humble. One of the main things you do to be humble is you submit yourself to God. Submit is another word, like obey. That is completely, politically, incorrect, and not even mentioned in a lot of churches. Submit, oh no, we're not into the, you know, all that submission error. We're just reading a verse. <laughs> Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now this is the verse I said a lot of folks quote only half of it. A lot of people only quote the last part. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That's not the entire verse. It doesn't start with resist the devil. It starts with submit yourself to God. Let me read some other translations of this to you. The Young's Literal says, Be subject then to God. Stand up against the devil. And he'll flee from you. Can you see there's a picture? Yield to God. Stand up to the devil. But you're not going to be able to stand up to the devil if you're resisting God. 
If you're resisting God, you're actually yielding to the enemy. If you're yielding to him, he's not going to yield to you. You're yielding to him. Uh, the complete Jewish Bible says a similar thing. Submit to God. Take a stand against the adversary and he'll flee from you. The Weiss translation says, be subject with implicit obedience to God at once and once for all. Stand immovable against the onset of the devil and he'll flee from you. We're talking about two different spirits. The spirit of Christ, he said, come learn of me. I am what? Meek. Meek. Humble. Lowly of heart. You'll find rest to your souls. And the spirit of the adversary, which is the spirit of error, which is the spirit, Ephesians says, that now works in the children of disobedience. Satan in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is called the God of this world. And in Ephesians, he's called the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. This whole earth is infused with the spirit of rebellion. There is defiance everywhere you look. There is attitude. <laughs> is that right? Everywhere you look, and regardless of how it's expressed, it's basically nobody tells me what to do. People call it different things. Notice a lot of times it's called pride, such and such kind of pride. Well, there is no good kind of pride. I don't have time to explain all that. Put, study the scriptures for yourself on this and you'll see. There is no good kind of pride. It's all of the enemy. He's the proud one. He's the defiant, rebellious, disobedient one. And he is the God of this world. And as such, he's influenced the whole world this way. And that's more what you find than the other. And it comes out in all kinds of ways. It's always about the heart. <laughs> One of the most graphic examples of it is the 60s. <laughs> the 60s. <laughs> Call it what you will. But what, what, what was it? It was rebellion. Rebellion against any kind of authority. Against any kind of morals. Right? And against laws. And what was the result? Immorality everywhere. People hurt, unwanted pregnancies, abortions, and violence. Is that right? Violence. Well, who's involved in that? Stealing, killing, destroying. Who's that? That's people yielding to this defiant, rebellious spirit. And you see, he, he's, he's always trying to get this stirred up. Yeah, right, right. Always. We've seen this in recent times. In riots. Yeah. Is that right? right? People destroying pop, property and, and people doing things. And it's a basic defiance against authority. Right. And law. And order. Right. And... Uh, some of it of, of late has been against, against the police, against authorities. And uh, there, are, there are some police that have done wrong. Uh, years ago, Phyllis and I were on the wrong end of some police who abused their authority. It's a bad feeling when people in authority abuse their position. And here they are armed and you're not and they've got the law and you don't and they're doing something wrong. But I believe that's a tiny, tiny minority. Don't you? Of our, our police. Most of our police, but we got some good ones around here. 
Most of our police are exactly what Romans says. They are the ministers of God. Do you know that? Romans calls these authorities the ministers of God. They're anointed to do this. And, and they face danger on our behalf. And several of the outstanding public cases where people were killed and the results were so much riot. I want to ask you one question. What if they had simply complied with the instructions of the authority? What if they had simply, when the, when the police said, put your hands behind your back, we're taking you in. What if they had just done that? Would they still be alive? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir, Is that worth anything? Yeah. Does it matter? Yeah. Yes, sir. Again and again, people try to justify. And just because you get mad and upset about something doesn't mean you got a right to go into the street and burn buildings down. That's right. Does it? No. This is devilish. It is of the devil. <laughs> uh, what did the scripture say? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The word submit and subject are similar in the scriptures and this is their meaning. Subject is actually a military term. It means to rank or arrange under. Submit literally means to yield to or to surrender to. To submit to someone means you acknowledge they have a place over you and you take a place under them and you yield to their will. This is contrary to your flesh. <laughs> but are you going to let your flesh dominate you? Submit yourself to God. Now, the main ways that you submit yourself to God is number one, by submitting yourself to His Word. Hmm? If His Word says it, no matter how you feel, yield to it. Give it the place over you. Take your place under it. Submission to God involves submission to His Spirit. Whatever the Spirit says to you, which will always be in line with the written Word. Submit to that. And thirdly, submission to God includes submission to people that He has placed over you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Again, politically incorrect. But reads, the Bible reads the same way as it always has. Yes, Let me give you some scriptures since I, I sensed a, a, some excitement move over the. <laughs> I'm talking by faith now. Ain't I? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. I need to talk some more about the spirit of rebellion. You have experienced the spirit of rebellion and you have yielded to it. <laughs> you have and I have. We all have. That's how you got lost. That's how you became lost. When you're born a baby, you're not lost. You're innocent. You don't know good from evil. Your little spirit's alive to God. But when you come to an age where you can understand the difference between right and wrong, at some point, you, me, every one of us got rebellious and we defied what we knew was right and we did what we sh knew we shouldn't do. We refused to do what we knew we should do and we died spiritually. Oh, but by the grace of God, yeah. hallelujah, we believed on Him and were born again. Yeah. Hallelujah. And we do not have to be 
like the rebellious world, unsaved world round about us. We can be like our master. But whatever spirit you're yielding to, it's going to show up in your life. It, it, it shows up in everything you do. It shows up in the music you listen to. Hmm? A lot of music. The reason why it's so appealing is because it's so rebellious. It's so defiant. It shows up in the way you dress. A lot of, a lot of re- way uh, some folks dress, they only dress that way because they think somebody doesn't want them to. <laughs> Hairstyles, same thing. If, if, if authority and convention was telling them wear it short, they're going to wear it long. If they say wear it long, they're going to wear it short. <laughs> and the reason the styles keep changing it's, a, it's because the spirit of disobedience is in the earth. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's not 100% with everything, but the heart of it. Uh-huh. Hmm? Yes, sir. The things people do and the way they do it and the way they talk. The spirit of this world is always demeaning and belittling disrespecting. Nothing's holy, nothing's sacred, nothing's important. What I'm talking about is learn to identify the spirit of rebellion. For it's the spirit of the enemy, the God of this world. And you want to examine yourself. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why not just do what you're told? That's a novel thought. (laughs) Why not just do it the way you were told to do it? Why not just be obedient? Well, they're wrong. Nah, I hear from God too. And (laughs) it's just echoes of the past reverberating through the present. That's exactly what the enemy did. That's exactly what he breathed into our parents, Adam and Eve. Why not just stay away from that tree? Why not just do what God told you to do? That's easy for us. Thousands of years later, look back and go, Adam, (laughs) Eve, why couldn't you just leave the tree alone? But you're being a hypocrite if you say that. (laughs) Because you have done exactly the same thing repeatedly. (laughs) What? You did what you shouldn't have done. Didn't do what you should have done. Why? You knew better. This is not about making an innocent mistake. The Lord knows your heart. (laughs) My, my. This is growing on me. 1 Thessalonians 5. Listen fast. (laughs) 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, I gave you three things I believe the Lord gave me. What does it mean to submit to God? Help me out. What does it mean? How do you submit to God? Number one, you submit to His written Word. Number two, you submit to His Holy Spirit. Number three, you submit to people. Uh, that, and most people will agree with one and two. <laughs> But I'm, I'm showing you now why three is right too. First Thessalonians 5, 12. We beseech you, brethren, know them which labor among you and are what? Over you. Are what? Over you. Over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now, at first glance, you might think, well, that's making, that's making much of people But no, it's making much of what God said. People who would be over you in the Lord, their biggest fault is that they're like you. They don't know everything. They can make mistakes. And you may not be able to appreciate 
everything they say and do. But you must respect the place or elsewise you disrespect God who gave the place. Uh, look in Romans 13 real quick. Romans 13, one, or they'll put it up on the, the screen for us. Romans 1.13, I'm going to read this from the uh, Weymouth's translation. Romans 13, what did I say? 13.1 is what I'm trying to say. Romans 13.1, Weymouth. Let every individual be obedient to those who rule over him. For no one is a ruler except by God's permission. And our present rulers have had their rank and power assigned to them by Him. Doesn't mean everything they do is of God. Verse 2, Therefore the man who rebels against his ruler is resisting God's will. And those who thus resist will bring punishment upon themselves. This is, is what the, the Lord showed me yesterday. Uh, those who resist and rebel, they bring punishment or destruction on themselves. The enemy knows this. Uh, go to 1 Peter 5. I'm glad you're quick today. 1 Peter 5. And five, you younger, do what? Submit yourselves. Now listen to this language because it's going to come up again. Who's going to submit you? You submit yourself. That's how this works. Submit yourselves to the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with what? Humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Same thing James said. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Keep going. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, now oh my. Can you see Complete trust is involved in this. People have pulled this verse out of this context and said, cast all your care. No, he's talking about submission and humility and casting all your care. Why do you need to cast your care on him when you're submitting? <laughs> oh, yeah, you do. I said, yes, you do. Because you're going to run up against some things that's going to tempt you not to submit. If I don't submit, or excuse me, if I submit to them, I won't get to do what I want to do. <laughs> if I submit to them, who knows how they'll take this thing. If I just yield and follow them, this is where faith comes in. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Cast all your care about that. Yeah. Over on me, oh. trust me that I'm going to take care of you. Wow. How many think we should keep verses in context? Yes. Yes. Come on, keep reading. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. Why? As you're submitting, as you're humbling yourself, you cast your care on him, for he cares for you. Keep reading. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This is in line with our text. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured. This is the answer to the question. Yes, it is. Whom may he devour? Those that are not humble. This is the answer to the question. This is the thing I said the Lord showed me yesterday. Do you need to keep this in context? Verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. If you are proud, God resists you. 
The enemy knows what happened to him. He knows what happened to him and what's going to cause his, whether he wants to admit it or not, what's going to cause his complete destruction. And so he knows if he can get you to do what he did, you'll be destroyed just like him. Submit yourself. Humble yourself. Cast your care over on the Lord and watch out for the enemy. Right? Because he's seeking whom he may devour. Whom may he devour? Those that resist God and yield to him. In defiance and rebellion, he can destroy. Which is why you're so tempted to have attitude. You, me, every one of us in this earth, the very air, the Bible said the prince of the power of the air, the very atmosphere is permeated with a pull to disobey. And that's why, without even thinking about it, somebody can tell you something to do, especially if they didn't say it in a nice, soft tone. (laughs) And just say it. Maybe what they told you to do, they had every right to tell you to do it. It's something that you should do. It's everything's right about it. But just when they said, do this, or especially if they said, obey, (laughs) what does your flesh do? I saw a documentary one time, oh, this has been 10, 15 years ago at least, I thought it was really interesting. This guy wanted to do an experiment concerning people that were uh, homeless. He went out to a place and found where some people were living in cardboard boxes, living on the street, had been for some time, and he left a briefcase of like, I think it was at least $100,000, right there by where one of these guys was living, and watched. And the guy got it, and opened it up, and of course, he was (laughs) pretty thrilled about it, and the guy showed up and told him it was his, but that he he would let him have it if he could follow him around and document uh, with, with their film crew. He said, yeah. So the guy went to the hotel and got him a hotel room and got cleaned up and got him some food and, and all that. And then he, uh, uh, he got some stuff for his friends. And, and as the months, weeks went by, he, he bought him a, a new pickup. And uh, he got him a place where he was staying. And, and one of the reasons he had given in times past was they asked him what had happened. And he said, well, he couldn't get a job because he didn't have a place to stay. And and, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, now he has a place to stay and he has a, a car. And so they say, well, you know, uh, uh, it's been, you know, six months and, you know, this money ain't going to last forever. I mean, it's, you're spending it up. You're going to get you a job. He said, yeah, yeah, he would, but, but he didn't. And, and months went by and months went by and finally he's about out of money. He's going to have to leave the place he's staying and, and, and he's going he's to need to sell the truck. And, and, and he wound up completely back at zero wow. and, and one of the things the guy said just stood out to me the, the guy asked him he said well now you, you know you, you didn't get a job and you didn't do this there were even some people who offered to him that he could come to work for them and he said well he said I don't like people telling me what to do wow. I don't like people telling me what to do. And within just a matter of months, he was back in the cardboard box on the street. Now, I'm not saying it would be be that way with everybody. There are some folks, if they get an opportunity, they're coming out. But there is a whole lot of people, it wouldn't matter the opportunity if you don't fix the reason why they got there. It's just a matter of time till you're there again. What will cause it to go well with you? (laughs) 
and live long. You got to be willing. You got to be obedient. I mean, it, it just reverberated through me when he said that. The Lord, he, he just, it's like he was pointing to it. And he said, look at this. Listen to this. He said, I just, I just don't like people telling me what to do. So he would rather live in a cardboard box than have to listen to somebody or submit to somebody or obey somebody. This is not uncommon. Do you want to be like that? Are you willing for it to cost you? No. I believe it's better to obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. Is that right? Where are you? Huh? Huh? Did, did you get the thing? So I'm telling you what the Lord told me the other day. Did you get the thing? What's, how does the enemy devour and destroy people? He gets them to do what he did. Rebel, defy, disobey, and he knows if you do that and won't repent, you'll be destroyed. He knows that. Are we ignorant of his device? Then let's not yield to it. Let's stop yielding to it. Go with me to Exodus, please, for time's sake. Exodus. I know, you know, some of these things people don't think as exciting as other things. Not you, but some people. But I think it's pretty exciting to not get destroyed. Is that right? I think it's pretty exciting to not mess up when God puts you in the right place. To not mess up what he's trying to do for you and prosper you. I know a a pastor friend of mine. Oh, this would have been 20 years ago or so. He had a young man that was uh, helping him as an associate. A young man, not married. And... uh, this man, this pastor, this senior pastor is a good guy and a generous guy. Guy, man of faith and, and, and love. Believes in prosperity. And uh, the young guy's doing a pretty good job. And, and so uh, he came to him and said, you know, I, he didn't like some little something that had happened. He said, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave. He said, are you sure you know, pray about this? He said, uh, uh, you know, did the Lord tell you to come here? Yeah, yeah, but I, you know, just just young and dumb. <laughs> He's going to leave. Well, he did his best. He tried to talk to him, tried to get him to pray, tried to get him to just put it off a little while, think about it. He wouldn't do it. All the, and very disrespectful. The man asked him, come in, sit down, listen to me. He wouldn't do it. Stood up, no, nah, I'll just stand, you know, all this kind of stuff. So he left. And next time I was there, I talked to the guy. I said, where's this young guy? Man, wasn't he doing good? He said he was doing well. But he got this burr under his saddle about this deal. And he looked at me. He said, nobody knows this. He said, I was getting ready to give him a house. Already had it in the works to give him a house. He missed it. That's one example. If you don't stay where God puts you long term, you're going to miss some things. I said, you're going to miss some things. And when you're getting close to something, you know what the enemy's going to do? He's going to come and try to stir something up, get you upset about something, mad about something, hurt about why he doesn't want you making it all the way to these blessings and it being a witness and other people seeing it and getting encouraged, maybe even get drawn to the Lord. He don't want to see any success, any prosperity. Go where you're stationed. Go where you're sent. Stay where you're stationed. You stay unless and until the Lord tells you something else. You're not led in by the Lord and led out by an offense. Right. 
Exodus. This is the account, verse chapter 24, where Moses, th this is actually amazing. If you haven't read this or read it carefully, I recommend you read it again carefully. It is amazing. God said to Moses and the elders, come up to the mountain. And he actually had a meal with them. It didn't say he ate, but they came and they saw him. They saw his form. They saw his, it said it looked like sapphire that he was sitting on. God. This is amazing. And after this meet and greet <laughs> with God, he told them they could stay there and he wanted Moses to come on up in the mountain with him. And for the next 40 days and nights, Moses was there with him and one-on-one, -on -one, God gave him the plans for the tabernacle, all the articles, the way worship and sacrifice was to occur. I mean, 40 days and nights. And, uh, and the glory and the experience was so intense that when Moses came down, his face was shining like a light bulb. And it would be a wonderful story, except for what happened with the people before he got back. Anybody remember? <clears throat> Exodus 31, verse 18. We're going to read a few verses here. Exodus 31, 18. He gave to Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Somebody say Amazing. Keep reading into the next chapter now, chapter 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, now how long? Six weeks. Six weeks ago, less than two months, six weeks ago, they saw the glory, they heard the voice, they said, the Lord, he is God. Whatever he says to us, that's what we will do six weeks ago. And uh, so Moses delayed to come down. I don't know why you would assume it's such a big delay. He didn't say how long he'd be gone. He didn't know. Right. The Lord just told him, come up here. Yeah. Yeah. The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, and they said to him, up. Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we, what not, we don't know what has become of him. Do you recognize this devilish, disrespectful, this, this Moses? See, whatever spirit you're yielding to, it's going to come out in the way you address people. In the way you act around people. Hmm? Everything you do. It, it can affect the way you, you style your hair. The way you dress. The music you listen to. A lot of stuff people are doing. They're only doing it because they think somebody doesn't want them to. Defiance. So uh, keep reading. Aaron said to them, Break off the gold earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. What an idea. Where did he get this? And all the people broke off the gold earrings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. <laughs> and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And he said... These be your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What? This is the birth of a new religion. 
This is how they all start. Every religion of man is birthed out of rebellion. It is. Everyone, if, if, you could, if you could know the history, every culture, I don't care if it's thousands of years old, there was a time when some of them knew God. But at some point, somebody didn't want to acknowledge God and submit to God, so they, the enemy was right there to give them an idea, like go get all the earrings. Go make this gold calf. It's total rebellion. Right. So they're rebelling against God. They're rebelling against Moses. And uh, he said, these are your gods. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Aaron made a proclamation, tomorrow is a feast of, of the Lord. Let's keep reading some of this. Keep reading. They rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, go get you down for your people, which you brought out of the land of Egypt. Have cor- We're laughing, but it wasn't funny. God is angry. Six weeks ago, the Lord, he is God. Whatever he says, we'll do. He said, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Now, They've made them a a molten calf. They've worshipped it and sacrificed there too. They said, these are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. These are your gods? Who split the Red Sea? Who protected them in the land of Goshen when people were dying on the right and left and everywhere? Who? And you're going to rise up and go, nah, we don't know what happened to Moses or his God. We got us a new God. Can you see their rejection of God was directly connected to the rejection of who he put over them? Disrespect and in rejection. This Moses. These are your God. Keep keep reading. The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. Behold, it is a stiff-necked people. What is stiff-necked? Unyielding. Unsubmitting. He said, leave me alone. That my, why would he say, leave me alone? <laughs> he knows he's going to pray for them. Leave me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I'll make of you a great nation. Boy, it's a good thing Moses wasn't full of pride. Because that might have sounded good to him. The nation of Moses. He could have said, hey, I'm tired of them too. (laughs) I am fed up. You say up, they say down. I say go and they say no. I say stay and they say no, we're going. Sure, he was tired of it too. Moses besought the Lord. He said, Lord, why does your wrath wax hot against your people? See, two verses earlier, (laughs) the Lord told him it was his people. He said, they're your people, which you brought forth out of the land of Egypt with your great power and your mighty hand. Keep going. Why should the Egyptians say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? They're going to say, you know, you could, you destroyed them because you couldn't bring them into the promised land. He said, uh, turn from your fierce wrath. Repent of this evil against your people. Thank God for somebody that will intercede. Hmm? Thank God. Elsewise, there are numerous situations where all that would happen next is just judgment. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Don't, Don't look at them right now. Don't look at them. You remember Abraham? You liked him, right? You liked <laughs> Isaac, Jacob, you remember them? Don't, don't look at them. Right? 
Remember, you swore by your own self and you said, I'll multiply your seed, which that's who these are. As the stars of heaven, all this land I've spoken, I'll give to your seed. They'll inherit it forever. Keep going. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This defiance, this rebellion, it's always been, happened with the angels before we ever got here on the earth. It's happened with generations of mankind. It got so bad during the time of Noah. There weren't but eight people on the whole planet that were doing anything except total full out rebellion and defiance. And notice, the more people rebel, the more violence there is. Yes. Yes. The earth was filled with violence. Yes. Yes. We've seen it just with these smatterings we've been talking about. People taking to the streets, attacking police, burning up police cars, burning down people's businesses. Yeah, right. yeah. That is rebellion. I don't care what happened, it doesn't justify that. No. Amen. Doesn't justify that. And there are some bad things that have happened. But people need to look at the simple question we asked earlier. What if somebody had just complied? That's right. Thanks be unto God. I want to be like Jesus. How about you? Not like the enemy. I, I want to yield to him. He said, I, I do always those things that please the Father. Is that right? In Ephesians, in closing, go with me please, if you would. Tell me how you submit to God. Submit to his word. Submit to his spirit and to those that have the rule over you. Now, I just gave you one verse in Thessalonians. There's at least three different times in the book of Hebrews he refers to those that have the rule over you. There are other scriptures throughout the, other verses throughout the word. But coming back to this, in Ephesians 6 and 5, Ephesians 6, 5, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. And fear, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Now, another way of saying this would be uh, employees and employers. Be obedient with fear and trembling. It don't sound like our society. <laughs> Verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service. Now is everybody awake? Yes. Doing it how? As to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. People don't submit because of pride and selfishness. But also a big reason why people don't submit is simply lack of faith. Right. Lack of trust. We saw this in 1 Peter 5. Cast all your care over on him. Talking about submitting and then resisting the enemy. Phyllis and I had the privilege of serving with Brother Kenneth Hagin Sr. and his wife Miss Aretha for 20 years. And uh, the Lord taught us things during that time about submission and respect. And they are great people to, to serve with. Uh, one of the first times that I was uh, helping, I, I was singing and playing in the healing school, and Brother Hagin was teaching there in the afternoons. And um, on one occasion, oh, I've been going, I don't know, just a couple of months, 
And a, a young lady would lead singing part of the time, and I would lead singing part of the time. And he was getting to the close of the service, and he looked over, and he said, y'all come up and get ready to dismiss. And uh, she looked at me and said, well, you, you going to do it? And I said, well, you can if you want to. And she said, well, I don't care. You can. And, and so we sat there and, and, and talked about it another two or three minutes. And he kept closing, and we didn't get up and move. Not a long time, but a little while. And he looked over and he said, if I'd known it was going to take you that long, I wouldn't have called on you in front of the whole crowd. Now, a lot of folks might think, well, that's too harsh. I kind of thought it was harsh at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I jumped up and, and I ran up. And, and in, in the future after that, I, had, I actually had a pastor ask me one time because Brother Hagin sometimes would call me up at the end of the service and I'd get up and I wouldn't take any time getting up there. I mean, I, I would get right on up there and they would say, man, you, you move when he calls you. Why do you do that? Out of respect for the Lord, it was more than him. The Lord showed me. I wasn't too happy about it because it embarrassed me. But as I went and prayed about it and the Lord said, you were being disrespectful to the Lord. Was why I prompted him to say it like that. You needed to be jerked because you're being disrespectful. What else you got going on that's more important than this? Didn't you know the service was about to end? This is your job. Why aren't you thinking about it? Why aren't you getting ready? Why aren't you preparing? See this looseness, this laxness, is disrespect, and when you know it's what you should be doing, what else is it? It's rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get around to it. And one of the first times that I, I, I did a song in the, their big meeting, their camp meeting, this was even prior to that, he called me up, and the Lord gave me a song, it went well. This was one of the first times I'd ever done anything like that. And him and Miss Aretha, after the service, they came back in the back, and I was there, and Phyllis was there, and they both commended me. They said, that was a good job, Keith. Man, you did a good job. And I, I don't know why I said it, but I said, uh, I said yeah, I'll, I'll get to it eventually. And they both looked at me and said, it better be sooner than later. Wow. Well, I thought that was unnecessary, too. <laughs> I thought, well, <laughs> but again, why would you loiter around and drag around and mess around if you could get to it quicker? Right. Why wouldn't you do the best you knew how? See, it's not a matter of just giving them respect. It's a matter of giving the Lord respect. Yes, that's it. That's it. And when you're talking about submitting to people who are over you in the Lord, I, I did respond quickly after that, and I did make some changes. And, and I, we did love the Hagans, but we weren't doing these things just because we love them. Right. We're doing it out of respect for the Lord. Yes. Can you see that? We're responding to them because we're doing it unto Him. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Do you believe it? Yes. Stand on your feet, everybody.